Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. In March, which is Iowa History Month, the Iowa History 101 webinar series expands to every Tuesday and Thursday. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend. And don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we honor the actress Donna Reed, who was born in Denison a century ago on January 21, 1921. We will learn more about Donna Reed from photos of her early days in Iowa, stories of her Oscar winning career, and her enduring impact on a new generation of performing artists through the development of the Donna Reed Foundation. A few housekeeping points before we introduce our speakers. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers in the order they will present. Mary Owen is the youngest daughter of Donna Reed and Tony Owen. For the last 11 years, Mary has been working towards preserving Donna Reed's legacy, which includes introducing It's a Wonderful Life to national audiences since 2007 and sitting on the board of directors of the Donna Reed Foundation in Denison. Mary has exhibited her mother's World War II letters at the FDR Library and Museum in Hyde Park, the New York Historical Society in New York City, and the World War II Wright Museum in New Hampshire. Mary recently moved to Iowa City to better support the Donna Reed Foundation and her mother's legacy during the centennial anniversary. Our second speaker is Kurt Lee. Kurt is a television and pop music historian. He has helped provide research, film footage, and Oh, my apologies. Research, film footage, and collectible pieces for museums, documentaries, and other various topics, including the release of the Donna Reed Show on DVD. He has been on the Donna Reed Foundation Board for 10 years and is the board secretary. And the program today will be moderated by state curator, Leo Landis. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Mary to begin the webinar. Okay, there we go. Oh. I'm coming. Hello, everyone. Hope you can see me. Um, thank you all for joining us, uh, celebrating 100 years of my mother, who you all know is Donna Reed. She was born uh, January 27th, uh, 1921. And I wanted to introduce you here, our first slide, to um, my grandparents. So these these fine people were moms, mom and dad, uh, Hazel Jane Shives and William Richard Mullinger. Um, I have a box in the way, I guess I'll just click. Okay, there we go. Sorry, little technical difficulties. Yes, yeah, so grandma and I will refer them when I can as grandma and grandpa. They were a huge influence on uh, my life, uh, my mother's life. Uh, this photo was probably taken by my mother in the late 60s and uh, they were just wonderful people. Uh, my grandfather was third generation Iowa settler as well as uh, grandma. Her family, gran grandpa's family, um, he's the son and the grandson of early settlers in William Reform Mullinger. His great grandfather settled uh, in Audubon County at first and then his grandfather, William George Mullinger, uh, was the first one to buy the farm that my mother grew up in, in Crawford County. So take a good look at these faces. We're going to go back in time and catch them when they were just youngsters. Uh, so Jennifer, if you could go to the next slide, please. This was the Mullinger farm. Um, it looks massive here, but it was actually quite humble. Um, and on the right, my mother had a pen pal. She had several pen pals, but 
her pen pal, Violet Lindsay, they stayed in touch. They started uh, corresponding with each other when they were 13 up until uh, 1986 when my mother passed away. And this was one of mom's, included in one of mom's letters to Violet was her uh, drawing of the farm, which was kind of interesting that she drew it from above. But um, you can see the house is so small compared, but grandpa planted all these trees. You can see some of the trees in the photograph on the right, but it was actually very lush where the house was. And, um, and then the school, I think the little red schoolhouse that she attended there was across the way. And then the river, it was, um, you know, my grandfather loved farming. He, uh, when he was in school, um, his teachers uh, encouraged him to go to college and told him he was a fine man and he shouldn't drink or smoke, <laughs> which he didn't. Um, so, but he loved farming and he farmed the land for over 50 years. And I think by the time he retired, uh, the original acres was, I don't know, about 120 and it was about 450, 500. And he was innovative in a lot of areas in soil conservation. I think um, my uncle Bill and he invented um, some kind of machinery. He did a lot of, um, he came up with a lot of interesting ideas for farming back in the day. Um, okay, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is the Shive side. Um, on the left here, we have an early photo of um, Mary Etta Petta Shives and Charles Shives. This, um, these were my, my grandparents, so they were, Great grandparents, sorry, I get confused. So this was my grandma Shives family on the left. And if we go really slowly, grandma's um, on the far right and just uh, standing below her is her sister Mabel. Um, apparently grandma was born rather sickly and thought maybe she wouldn't survive. And Aunt Mabel wrapped her up in like a little, you know, on her and carried her around every day and, you know, nurtured her and healed her and really was like part of probably the main reason why she survived. So anyway, these are the shives probably on the left when they first got married. And this is um, grandma and grandpa shives after nine children. Okay, can we go to the next one? And this is uh, Grandma Shives, this photograph, um, these two photographs my mother kept on her dresser for as long as I can remember. Um, grandma's 18 here, and she was going to go off to college, but she uh, got sick and she had, all, she had to go to Omaha for surgeries, and that kept her from furthering her education. But she was really one of the brightest people. She was so... Uh, lively and intelligent and uh, and also as you can see a great beauty. Yeah, okay next slide please. So grandpa um, had a brief stint, uh, he didn't see action in World War I but he was um, stationed at uh, Fort Dodge in Des Moines and he worked, uh, you know, this was 1918. So guess what? That was uh, our last pandemic. So he actually worked quite, uh, most of what he did was uh, help uh, take care of uh, flu victims. And so he was uh, participated in that for about a couple of years and then ended up in Pensacola, Florida, and then and in the army and then came back to Denison. And his only job was uh, he worked at a seed store briefly, but um, then just immediately jumped into farming. And Mary, this is Leo, just to chime in quickly. We like to confuse people because we do have Fort Dodge, which is a community, but the base where your grandfather was stationed was Camp Dodge, which Camp is- Camp Dodge, sorry. No, okay. you're all good. So Camp <laughs> Dodge, just north of Des Moines. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that he uh, spent so much time caring for um, people in his military duties because um, I'll talk about it more later, but my mother, my grandmother um, came down with Parkinson's uh, in the early 50s and she was sick with it until she died. So over 25 years and his care for her, he was so devoted to her and the way he cared for her was kind of unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like that before. So I know he was, you know, that way 
already that he was, you know, a gentle spirit, even though he was such a hard worker and a really tough guy. Um, he also cared deeply for her for, for over 20 years. Yeah. So, okay, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, the early days of courtship here. I think the Mullingers and the Shives, because they lived a little, you know, they were in Crawford County, they weren't in Denison, so they were about six or seven miles out of town. They uh, knew each other. So this is in Lakeview, and that's uh, Grandpa on the left, and uh, Grandma there in the middle with her beautiful little cap. I don't know if they knew how to swim, quite frankly, but um, anyway, and that's uh, Grandma's youngest um, a sibling, Inez. And, and when grandma and grandpa did uh, get married in 1920, um, they honeymooned in Lakeview. So yeah, they look pretty, pretty happy there. All right, can we go to the next slide? So 1921, January, there's mom. <laughs> I've um, We've got some other pictures of her just crawling around in the grass. Uh, incredible, I've never seen her quite this uh, small before, but yeah, there she was on the porch. I don't know, um, I think they moved to the farm uh, just before uh, mom was born. I think they weren't living on the farm quite yet. So it must've been, they must've been living with um, my great grandfather, George, William George, and then great grandma, Marianne Mullinger, who I'm actually named after. I know I got a lot of people asking me if I was named after Mary Bailey, that would be a no. And um, there are a lot of Marys uh, on the Mullinger and the Shive side, but I was named after my great grandmother, Mary Mullinger. So yeah, take a good look at that little face. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so my uncle Keith, so the, my mom had four siblings. There were five kids all together. She was the oldest. Um, Keith was born in 1922, so that's a cute picture of Grandpa with uh, Keith and Mom. Um, not exactly sure where that is. Could be the farm, but then uh, that might be one of the, yeah, yeah, it's definitely on the farm. Yeah, I would bet that's the farm, Mary, just to chime in again. You can see for people that are looking, that's a hay mower that's the piece of equipment just off the uh, yeah. And then I'm guessing the barn where uh, they kept some of the hay stored loose hay so yeah it's true because uh, it's true because when i look back at that diagram the the hay barn and etc are actually pretty close to the house so yeah yeah so okay next slide please okay um so grandpa um only had two sisters um ruby and my aunt mildred um I don't know why I called her Aunt Mildred, but anyway. And then of course, as you saw, uh, Grandma Shives had a huge family. So they loved to get together. I'm not exactly sure who all is in this picture, but if you can see in the very back, um, the second person in is Grandpa holding, maybe it's Keith, uh, maybe it's uh, my Uncle Bill because he was born in 1927. Um, then it might be Keith there in the front with his uh, hand up, then LaVon next to, um, so that's my mother's first sister. Then it looks like mom is uh, next to LaVon. And then um, grandma looks like she's above the two of them uh, wearing a, a stylish hat. She always looked good. Um, I'm not sure, I even sent this picture to my aunt Karen and she really couldn't tell who the rest of the people are. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, but I'm sure there's some shives in there and yeah, but they did like to gather and uh, there were lots of um, dinners and socializing and out on the farm and it was a very warm, you know, family. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to, uh, yeah, 1943, 1944. So um, grandma got pregnant in her forties and she gave birth to my aunt Karen who was born in 1943, and that's her on the bottom there. And uh, moving left to right is my Aunt Mildred, who was grandpa's sister. She was wild. For as restrained and hardworking and tough as grandpa was, Mildred was such a character. She uh, moved around a lot. She didn't stay in Denison for very long. The first guy she married, uh, they moved to Kansas City, and um, she had a daughter named Charlotte. 
Then the husband died and she remarried. She got married to Charles Van Campen and they ended up moving to Los Angeles. So that's Aunt Mildred on the far left. Then that's my great grandma, uh, Marianne Mullinger, grandpa there, and then uh, grandma on the far right. So it's because of Mildred, I mean, she factored a huge part in my mother's career because uh, when mom finished uh, high school in Denison High, there was really no opportunity for her to go to college in Iowa. So Aunt Mildred invited her to uh, move to Los Angeles and live with her. And at the time, Los Angeles City College, which actually did have a good drama department, was only maybe $5 you know, a class and it was affordable. So mom moved in with Aunt Mildred. Of course, she drove her crazy. She worked her to the bone while she was trying to go to school. And, um, um, but that was, you know, I mean, she hopped on a train with this big trunk and she was the first person to leave um, Denison. And uh, I know grandma always used to say she felt like she had done something wrong because all of her siblings, except my um, uncle Bill left, left Iowa. Yeah, of course that had nothing to do with it. <laughs> So yeah, there's Aunt Mildred. Um, okay, next slide, please. So mom uh, moves to Los Angeles. She uh, attends uh, classes at Los Angeles City College. You know, I don't think she ever intended to be a movie star. I, I, I figure if she thought of anything into the uh, business, it might've been radio. That's probably what they were more used to in Iowa. And the last year she was a student they uh, initiated their beauty contest, their campus queen at Los Angeles City College. So she won. And this was the photograph in the Los Angeles Times that really changed everything. Um, I think it was on the front page. And after that, uh, all kinds of agents, Hollywood people, modeling agents came uh, knocking on her door. And like the good Iowan that she was, she insisted that she finish her college studies before she signed any contracts. So she only had one more semester left. And then she decided to go with MGM and she signed an eight year contract. But this is, she. so she moved from um, Denison to Los Angeles in 1938. And by 1941, can you imagine how quickly she was under eight year contract with MGM? And look at how beautiful she was even then. This is um, my copy that I have now, but this was her framed copy of this uh, picture of her that she always kept uh, in the bathroom for as long as I can remember. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. So when my mother <laughs> got married to my father in June of 1945, uh, part of, he was originally from Chicago when he moved to LA. So part of their honeymoon was to come and meet the Mullingers. So, uh, you know, they obviously used it as a kind of PR opportunity when you look at the photographs, but my favorite is uh, mom teaching dad how to drive the tractor there in the middle. So yeah, it was great to see grandma there and um, <laughs> they look so happy. They, everyone loved my father. Um, Uncle Bill named one of his sons, Tony, after my father. And, you know, he loved grandma and grandpa. So that was their first trip out to, um, to Iowa after getting married. Hmm. Okay, next slide. Um, right, so this must have been, uh, yeah, 1952, mom came out to visit and uh, I guess they promoted, they were you know professional photographers there too, but I just love this picture. I mean, look, it's four generations. We've got, um, my great grandma, Marianne Johnston Mullinger there on the far right. Then grandpa, look how handsome he is. Then my brother, Tim and mom. Yeah, I just love this photograph. And so in, um, so when mom went to high school, um, there were no buses or anything like that. And that was in town. So she moved in during the week uh, with uh, great grandma, uh, Mary Mullinger. And the, I believe this photograph must have been taken at their house. Okay, next please. Ah. <laughs> yeah, this is what my grandfather liked to do. <laughs> this was a thing. He would uh, climb up um, and go upside down on the ceiling and then he, he had the best laugh and the best smile. And this was just what he did. And there he is still doing it at the uh, tender age of his early eighties. 
He was also a master horseshoe player. And even when my brother Tim would come visit in Denison and they'd play a uh, horseshoe, grandpa would never let him win. <laughs> he was pretty competitive. But yeah, I, I saw grandpa in that position quite a bit, at least once a day. Okay, next please. Yeah, this is kind of funny. Um, so uh, the uh, Mullingers always had ponies and this looks like four out of five. So I think that's mom standing up and my aunt LaVon on the pony, then uh, uncle Bill there <laughs> with his hands in his pocket that looks typical of his character. And then uh, my uncle Keith holding the pony. And I just thought it was ironic because a lot of times mom would, um, I spent many summers in Denison with Aunt Sandy and Uncle Bill and my three cousins. Um, and so there I am on a pony and there's Toby on the far, that's Todd on the far left, then Toby in the middle and Tony. And we had great, great fun in Denison. I mean, it was a far cry from uh, growing up in Beverly Hills. We were so free in Denison. We'd ride bikes all day and sleep outside under tents, and, you know, play in the river. I mean, we just could do whatever we want during the day and nobody was worried. Nobody was worried I was gonna get kidnapped. It was great. So, yeah, I'm probably about 12 or 13 there, I would think. Okay, next slide, please. So this is an iconic photograph. Um, when my mother and father um, decided to start their own production company uh, after mom won her Oscar in 1954 in From Here to Eternity, incredible role, they, uh, she ended up in B Westerns with a couple of exceptions, but um, she was very frustrated with her career. And so she and my father decided to try their hand at television. First, they did made a couple of movies together and she came out to visit and so this um, is at the farm and my aunt Karen is on the left with the baby goat. My brother Tony there looking and Tim, <laughs> Tim's up higher there and then my uh, sister Penny on the far right. So um, when they were, and dad had this picture in his office and when they were trying to figure out if they do do a television show, what mom's role will be. Maybe she'll be a spy. Maybe she'll be, you know, work for the FBI. Maybe I think one of the ideas was she was going to be an elevator operator at the um, Chrysler building and every floor that they stopped at would be like an episode of intrigue. And then some producer just took one look at that photograph and said, well, why doesn't she play an incredible wife and mother, which she already is. So that really was the photograph that launched the idea for the Donna Reed show. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so this is, uh, I love this picture. Uh, in 1958, they made um, Ralph Edwards, I think that's his name, did one of those This Is Your Life programs on mom. And this was the first time um, all the Mullingers had been together in quite a while. Uncle Keith had um, moved to the East Coast and he raised his family there. Karen was in California going to college. Um, Uncle Bill was in Denison and uh, my aunt Heidi LaVon, she didn't care for that name. So she, her nickname was Heidi. Uh, she had a great modeling career. So she lived mostly in New York and then she uh, met her husband who my mother introduced her to and they lived in uh, Beverly Hills as well. So my mother and aunt Heidi were very close as um, Aunt Karen. So this is the, all of the family together on the set uh, of the Donna Reed show. For those of you who are familiar with the show, those are the stairs that you know mom walks down and quickly answers the phone at the beginning of every episode. So yeah. So I left out a lot, um, you know, an incredible family. My grandma was, you know, so sick for a long time and my mother did everything she could to help her with what they knew about Parkinson's. Um, she was always having state, you know, state of the art medication and surgeries and things like that. And grandma, for as sick as she was, it was mostly a nervous um, order. She never, she was as clear as a bell. She never had an unlucid moment in her life. And sadly, she passed away in 1975, at the age of 76. And then grandpa died um, about five years later. Yeah, yeah so. What a beautiful family, huh? Not only my mother, they're all gorgeous, right? All right, well, thank you. I think that's the last slide. And um, maybe we can talk more about mom's 
film career and the TV show? Yeah. That's fabulous, Mary. Thank you so much for sharing those photos with us at the Historical Society and with everyone joining us today. It was just really wonderful to see the photos, the Shives and, and Mullinger family. Yeah. Wanted to comment as we transition to the next part of the program, just to set up the conversation uh, for people who may not be as familiar with your mom's television show. Uh, the characters and the actors in the program were Jeff Stone, played by Paul Peterson on the left there, then Mary Stone, played by Shelley Fabre, Donna Stone, played by your mother, then Alex Stone, Dr. Alex Stone. Uh, he was a medical doctor who kept his office in the house in the show. And then uh, later, as the show was evolving and, and uh, Shelley Fabre was moving off, they were concurrent, but uh, Paul Peterson's sister, even though they spelled their names differently, came on as an adopted daughter, Tricia Stone. It ran for 275 episodes. And for those of you who uh, are subscribers to Amazon Prime, the program is, is up on seasons one through five through Amazon Prime. So with, with that set up, uh, wanted to also talk about uh, you know, the time your mom was growing up was really a, a challenging period in American history. We were going through the Great Depression. We were uh, in, in Iowa experiencing the Dust Bowl, just like uh, a lot of the Midwest was. The, the drought was affecting Iowa and the dust storms were affecting Iowa. Uh, 1933 and 1936 were just rough years for Iowa farm families. So uh, your mom certainly experienced a, a lot of challenges uh, like a lot of families did in that time period. And so as we talk about this, we'll, we'll have a chance to hear from you and Kurt, Mary, but I just wanted to uh, begin with hearing some thoughts on, you know, what, what themes in the Donna Reed show stand out to you and, and maybe one or two episodes or two or three episodes. Uh, that'll be for both you and Kurt, but let's start with you, Mary. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, my Aunt Karen was telling me that um, when she was growing up, I mean, even though she was younger, that the um, the Mullinger kids were never like the boys, and were never more valued than the girls. And I think um, too that you know, unless the the labor on the farm was like so extreme that that everyone did the same thing. Um, so I feel like you know, mother brought that kind of sort of communal values to the show. You know, it was, well, first of all, she was always busy. And I think, you know, from what I've heard, of course, by the time I got to know my grandmother, she was already sick. So I wasn't seeing her in action, but of course, mom really modeled her Donna Stone after grandma. So this kind of fluidly in the kitchen and, you know, she's, she may be a homemaker, but she's very busy doing things and making things right and being involved. But I think also, the, the theme of just, um, you know, they had women directors, women writers, people on the show that it was just merit-based. It didn't matter. You know, there was just this sense of quality that I think she really got from growing up with grandma and grandpa. That's fabulous. Good to know, again, that she was her, especially as the oldest child, she was the first one who probably could start doing work. I know she knew how to milk a cow. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Kurt, are there any episodes that, that jump out to you that emphasize any of those themes that Mary was talking about or, or uh, any, any comments you want to make just overall on the show? Um, sure. I was going to say that um, one of the episodes, uh, well, we had to pick seven episodes, which is hard to do, out yes. of 275 <laughs> that were done for a best of DVD one of them that Mary suggested uh, was from season one, and it was actually the seventh show that aired called The Three-Part Mother. And uh, so we put that on there, and it was just an excellent example of how busy a, a mom can be, you know. Uh, she has both of her children that have an event that night. Jeff has a basketball game. Mary's joining a club, and her husband, Alex, a major doctor in town has a major speech. How is she going to be in all three places at once, right? <laughs> and uh, it's kind of interesting because I think with Donna being a Midwest girl, she has this work ethic 
you know, that we see in her personal life and her real story and in the show too. Yeah. And uh, and that's kind of one of the examples and the way she solves it um, to give away what happens in the episode for those of you who haven't seen it (laughs) is she ends up watching a little bit of Alex's speech, runs out real quick, shows up a just basketball game, waves hello, you know, shows up just in time for Mary's thing and goes back to Alex's speech again. And just, yeah. and, and I thought, well, you know what? I remember that with my mother. <laughs> you know, there was just those times when everything hit at once. What yeah. do you do? And well, she always said that. So that's one example. Go ahead, Mary. She did say that the term working mother was redundant because, you know, what mother doesn't work? You know, she just happened to have a career, a professional career back in the days when that wasn't as typical as it is now. Yeah. And just to comment to folks who are following us today or watching in the future, that DVD is a good way to introduce yourself to the, the show. So even if you are, aren't a subscriber to a streaming service, uh, try to track down that DVD of the best of the Donna Reed show. That's a, that's a good option. Uh, and Kurt, I'll throw this at you. Uh, you know, how do you see the Donna Reed show and, and I'll ask you too, Mary, but yeah. Kurt gets to kick this one off. How do you see the Donna Reed show fitting in to television history and, and other programs? You know, um, I was just telling Mary the other day that uh, when Nick at Night went on the air, I didn't even know about the channel in 1985, just happened to get cable two weeks later. And there was the Donna Reed show in the lineup. And I was so wanting to see those because as a, TV historian, I was already into it at that time, you know, heavily, and uh, started watching those uh, episodes, you know, every night on Nick at Night, and I could just immediately see, wow, this show is not only has great actors where everything just really connects, I mean, everything seems real, I mean, I sometimes I watch other shows, and I think, oh, you know, I, I just felt that the acting was really good, in other words. But also the storylines were different. I thought, wow, this is, I can really relate to these storylines in my real life. And I just found myself tuning in every every day, not just because I had known about the show and they weren't showing in the Des Moines area, mm-hmm. even though it showed everywhere, but also just to, you know, just to see what was going to happen next. <laughs> So I'll, I'll I think it was done and, in history. And throw it over to Mary, but what yeah. episodes besides you know three part mother you know stick out to you, Kurt? That you know made you feel like oh this this relates to my experience too. Um, well, another one <laughs> that I love is called uh, Alex runs the house in season two, and that also relates to Donna's real life too because um, uh, Jeff the son goes off to see grandma and grandpa on the farm right they don't say iowa but and donna kind of misses them and she decides to to go as well and so it's alex and mary at home by themselves and they're eating every night and they're not doing the dishes and all these dishes pile up and suddenly donna's coming back in town so uh they have all these dishes so alex hurries up throws them all into the cupboards and in into the uh into the oven and into the washing machine and dryer which were in the kitchen is i remember when i was a little boy that's how our kitchen was too and so the kitchen appears spotless but donna sees it all and and when alex gets home late that night from a you know a a doctor's emergency call or something he thinks i better hurry up and wash all these dishes and get to bed and and he opens up the cupboards and they're all done. <laughs> They've all been washed and they're all clean. Donna had done it all in record time. And I thought, gosh, that's just another thing that I saw sometimes with my mother and my grandmother too. It's like really happened to, they could work very quickly, multitask, <laughs> you know. And and I'll jump to you now, Mary, and you referenced this, uh, People like, and uh, I may mispronounce the name, but Barbara Ava Don, who was one of the writers and then goes on to do mm-hmm. Cagney and Lacey. The, how do you see the show fitting into television history? Right, well. Yeah, Barbara uh, Ava yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know, I get so excited about the show because there's just so much going on underneath the surface. I think a lot of 
people don't, um, you know, first of all, of course, you know, the show's named after her, which, you know, was pretty cool <laughs> for 1958. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, you know, they, they tried their, you know, it was her responsibility, her and my dad. I mean, my father was the principal architect. He was the producer, but they did a lot of interesting things. I mean, they hired a blacklisted couple and I, because of the unions, it was a kind of don't ask, don't tell kind of way. And they're, um, as writers, they, their episodes have a, a distinct feel to them. The Geisha Girl with uh, Miyoshi Umeki, it's um, kind of about, I don't know, it's just about interracial marriage, let's just put it that way. Um, just a Housewife, of course, is a fabulous episode. That's from season two, where um, she, you know, kind of unpacks the idea of what it means to be a housewife. And, you know, nowadays we have all these terrible shows and I don't watch any of them, you know, the housewives of New Jersey and such and such. And so this word has now become something else. And I don't even know what stay at home moms if they want to be called anymore, right? Because housewife is almost like a dirty word, you know? <laughs> um, so I think the show just has a quality and a sophistication about it. Of course, not every single episode, but there's enough adult humor there that it's not just a kid's show, it really is a family show. And there's plenty of um, just, I don't know, a lot to be proud of, just how they worked the business, how they uh, tried to keep as much control as possible. And of course, you know, when my mother was ever given the decision to play a scene for laughs or not, she would rarely choose playing it for laughs. You know, she really took speaking to American families seriously. And so I think that's what, you know, makes it stand out. And plus you just, you, you feel like you're part of the family somehow watching the show. You know? I, I think that's represented too by the dedication that Shelley Fabre and, and uh, Paul Peterson had have to the foundation and maybe speak, we'll, we'll throw that to you first, Mary, speak to, you know, the relationship of uh, your, uh, stepfather or however you think of Grover Osmus and, yes. and also the uh, other stars of the show who, who were dedicated to the foundation in Denison and, and it's still an active and viable uh, organization and doing great things in, in Denison. Yeah, well, so when my mother passed away um, in, in January of 1986, she specifically left her, bequeathed her Oscar to Denison. So that summer we all came together and um, even though, and and memorialized it to, um, to the uh, town. And even though it was kind of a sad event, we, we had really, we loved being in Denison. We loved being together. There was just something really special about reconnecting with everyone. And one thing led to another for, with some local people and my stepfather Grover, um, and they decided to start the foundation. And I think it took a couple, you know, a few years for it to get rolling, but you know, my mother always believed in education and she was so bright. I mean, she really could have been a school, she could have been a college professor. And so we just, you know, decided to create this um, educational situation where kids from the Midwest who wanna go on in careers in the performing arts can get a chance to learn from people who, professionals who are still in the business. And that was kind of the heyday of the festival we, you know, after 9-11, we had to kind of stop with the festival because things turned down, but we're doing other things now. And um, her archive is there, which is incredible. I didn't even realize that she went all she kept. She kept everything from the film career, so much from the television show. So even as a research uh, area, it's fabulous. And um, for those of you who missed our tribute uh, on, on January 27th, if you go to DonnaReed.org, you can uh, watch the tribute there and you know the governor's proclamation and all the good things, thanks to you all. And the Iowa Department of uh, Cultural Affairs uh, putting this all together. Um, but yeah, the foundation is, is very active now and we're trying to have more of an online presence and have some um, you know, special events all through the year you know, with COVID. They'll probably be virtual for now. Sure. And, and Kurt, do you want to talk about uh, Paul Peterson and Shelley Fabre and their role on the, the show and, and how they, you know, continued their careers at all? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, interesting because he started really young. I remember uh, when the Donna Reed Festival first 
started in its second year, I was up there and I asked Shelly how old she was when she started the show. And she said 14 and a half. I think Paul was 12 and a half, maybe. And yeah, it's unbelievable. And so they really grew up on this show, especially with Paul, you know, uh, really shot up tall and, and voice changes and everything. And, and uh, but, you know, I felt like um, Paul was just really a talented actor, too. He could just bring such life to the yeah. to the show and i remember reading in jay fultz's book he did a bio on donna reed and and he and donna evidently said she had such a good time doing scenes with him <laughs> but you know storylines change as they get older as you know i uh, and so um then they allowed more storylines to center around the kids and the show just got, kept getting better and then on top of that Mary's father decides to have them both record music, you know, and, and they both ended up with a hit record and, you know, Johnny Angel went to number one. It was number one for two weeks and knocked out a Connie Francis record out of the number one spot. <laughs> Don't break the heart that loves you. And she was like one of the biggest artists of the day. And, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, how, how that all uh, went. So now they had singing careers on top of it. So, yeah. so it really does seem, uh, Mary, your mom and dad really did support the the lives, mm -hmm. not just the careers, but really the lives of the the young people on the show. And well, the Hollywood can be uh, cruel at times, and and Paul took that then in his own way as a as a as, as he matured. But uh, we do want to open things up for some of the questions that have come in. So uh, I've been getting those via Jennifer. So uh, we'll start with one that is. Uh, uh, one, maybe Kurt, you can speak to a little bit, but uh, I'll start with Mary on this one. What did your mom uh, talk about her experiences being under contract to MGM? Did she talk about that experience at all? Well, you know, I get asked those questions a lot. And the truth is, um, I was born after the film career was over and she was working on the television show. And the reality is, is that mom really tried to be a mom at home and keep the business out like that wasn't really possible because my dad was a producer he loved the business and the door you know people were just always coming and going but my mother was deeply private and um I think you know from what I can tell of course it was a great experience but I think working with Frank Capra and It's a Wonderful Life you know she had to be loaned out was an even greater experience because he was such a visionary and he didn't make movies you know kind of formulaically like MGM did, not to dismiss those MGM movies are fantastic. Um, but I don't, I, I don't, you know, she didn't stay there. So I can only assume that she was glad to move on. Sure. And, and Kurt, do you know, was that eight year contract, was that pretty, pretty standard for an actress? That, that seems like a long time to be under contract. Do you know how mm -hmm. that? Yeah, it does. But it sure was a different world back then. And, you know, uh, I hear over and over that the last person to actually sign a contract was Sandra D in the <laughs> late, late fifties. You, you might know her from the movie Gidget, you know, that became so popular um, because more and more people were breaking away. And we saw that in music too. And the, you know, as uh, the forties, uh, start getting closer to 1950 and the brands bands start breaking apart singers go out on their own and uh i think you know donna probably was wanting to do that as well you know uh move on and and uh but yeah it does seem like an awful long time but boy i'll tell you the the studios just controlled you you know it's kind of difficult what you could or couldn't do and you know what times you could be out at night <laughs> Well, and Don't also get yourself into the yeah. tabloids. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, and they just, you know, had her as what that kind of girl next door. So I'm sure she got tired yeah. of that after a while. Yeah, I really got typecast in that role. Yeah. Uh, Kurt, you referenced the Jay Fultz biography. So just to, that's one we'll send out mm -hmm. as a reference done by University of Iowa Press yeah. uh, a number of years ago. I haven't finished that biography personally, but I've, mm -hmm. I've read much of it. Uh, either for you to start, Kurt, or, or Mary, did, does that book talk about uh, any of the challenges 
of uh, getting into films that she felt, yeah, there you go. Uh, so that's- <laughs> I thought it's right behind me here. Yeah. yeah, it is an excellent book. He does a great job. Yeah, but any any special difficulties or challenges that Donna had in, in you know, once she's identified and signed a contract uh, with MGM, any anything that you're aware of that were difficult challenges for her? And I'll start with you, Kurt. Um, you mean, oh, difficulty in, um, yeah, during her MGM years. Hmm, nothing's really coming out uh, at the moment. I'll probably think of something right when you go to the next question, right? <laughs> That's right. And I think um, we set this up a little bit saying, you know, Donna Mullinger didn't go to Hollywood to, you know, yeah. LA to be an actress. She went to be, uh, you know, to take classes and, and expand her education. Mm -hmm. Did she ever share uh, with you, Mary, you know, how a little bit more than, than what you shared as we were looking at slides on, you know, did she feel under pressure from the studios? Were other, I mean, how did she decide on MGM, do you know? I don't know that, but I, um, because she didn't, you know, my father wasn't in the picture then because he was sure very instrumental in some of the decisions uh, she made after they were married and while they were going out. But um, I do know that, you know, my aunt, well, she wasn't related by blood, but Lillian Burns Sydney uh, was just one of the, she was the drama coach at MGM and they brought mom to her uh, once she signed, you know, once the ink was dry. And Lillian loved my mother. She really took her under her wing and she worked with her during her lunch breaks and in her office and she made sure she was being paid enough. So she was almost like uh, her protector. And she was uh, supposed to um, be scheduled for um, uh, work with uh, Van Heflin, I think. And um, Lillian said, no, 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 you know, keep putting it off because uh, my mother wasn't quite ready. You know, maybe she took a few acting classes at Los Angeles City College. All of her high school teachers said, "You'll never, you're way too shy." Um, and you know, my grandma was shy too. Uh, so that was a huge help. And the other thing that I think was difficult is that she was so beautiful that I think a lot of, you know, she was getting a lot of unnecessary attention from, you know, people in power, men. Um, uh, married men in power and you know she didn't really talk about how she handled that but that must have been the hardest part I would think. Sure yeah speaking to her work ethic that's one of the things Liz Gilman who is head of Produce Iowa within the Department of Cultural Affairs has brought in a number of other islands to talk we uh, that's why we wanted to feature your mom's story so much too but we've had you know another Academy Award winner the late now Cloris Leachman come oh, yeah. in uh, Tom Arnold talking about his film career and, and what we've heard from both of them and, and even Brandon Routh, uh, actor from Superman and, and also TV, oh, yeah. much like your mom did the, the jump over to TV, is, you know, the work ethic that they learned as being Iowans and not that other people in other states don't work hard, but that dedication that you were just talking about is, is something right. that if you want to be successful in Hollywood, you need to be a nice, decent person like your mom was, but also be hardworking, it sounds like. It's true. Yeah. And, and you know, I did think of something. Um, in 1958, not long before the Donna Reed show started filming, um, Donna Reed was the surprise guest on This Is Your Life. Um, for those of you that are watching us today that don't know what that show is about, that was a weekly show where they would surprise somebody famous. They might be thinking that they're just having dinner with a friend at a restaurant and then Ralph Edwards, the host, would come in and say, surprise, this is your life. Yeah. Bring them over real quick to the studio and, and bring in their whole family. And of course, you know, Donna's, all of her siblings and parents were flown in, teachers from Denison. It's so neat to see her in tears from this surprise. But um, when she went to Los Angeles City College, as Mary was talking about, they brought the people that she stayed with onto the stage. And the first words out of the, the lady's mouth was, you know, she was just a joy to be around. And she got up early every day. She not only did her schoolwork, she helped with everything around the house and these long hours. And it's just so impressive 
I mean, there you got it again, right there, the, the work ethic. And then, you know, to eventually end up starting their own show, Mary's parents, Donna and, and her father, Tony Owen, the Donna Reed show. A lot of people don't understand that they think that Lucy and Desi were the only people to own their own show and control everything. Donna Reed and Tony Owen did all of that. The only thing they didn't have was the studio. They filmed at Screen Gems, where a lot of other, you know, uh, famous shows were done too. I mean, if you you get certain shots, you'll see the Donna Reed house and next door is the Father Knows Best house, which became the I Dream of Genie house and down the streets, the Bewitched house. But anyway, uh, yeah, they, it, they hired all the actors. Donna really read over those scripts, you know? So I, I think you can continue seeing it on into the later years. She'd come home and take care of her family and have dinner, look over scripts and get to bed, get up early again the next day. That's a lot. <laughs> Tires me out thinking about it sometimes. <laughs> uh, we are getting lots of great questions. I'll, I'll try to answer this one if you want to throw anything else out there. Uh, we had a question asking if the Mullinger farm was stolen in the family. The answer is no. Uh, though, again, I know, Mary, you occasionally have conversations with the current landowners, but currently the farm is no longer in the family. Uh, then uh, it may be Kurt or... I'll go to you, Mary, Mary, on this one. How did she uh, get the name Donna Reed for her stage name? It was a Hollywood idea. Uh, um, first, uh, they called her Donna Adams, and then they realized there was another actor with the same name. But, you know, there's so many actors from that time period, not so much now anymore, that I think they thought, you know, World War I, II was coming. Mullinger sounds a little on the German side. And, you know, probably just had too many syllables, too. So she never really liked that name. But when she got deep into her genealogy and traveled to um, England to uh, meet with relatives that were still alive, uh, she found a relative that was Mary Bailey and someone else that had the last name Reed. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, again, this this could be for either of you, but uh, you know, there were a few other Iowans in Hollywood. Your mom was in two films with John Wayne, of course. Yeah. Uh, they were expendable and uh, trouble, trouble along the way. Is that the, That's it. Yeah. the, the other one? Mm -hmm. And uh, But there were people like Gene Seberg, who was also a peace activist like your mother and civil rights activist, uh, or uh, Andy Williams, of course, had a strong... Yeah presence did did any did your mom have any relationships with other Iowans in Hollywood that you're aware uh John Wayne friendly I've got some pictures of them together you know and sipping wine um but not you know it's funny getting back just to the MGM just to die for a second there is one story uh after she'd signed her contract she went out with her girlfriends one night and came back and the next day the studio had brought her in or, you know, head of production or something and sat her down and said, okay, we saw you outside last night. We are in the process of making you a movie star. You have to look perfect all the time. And believe me, did she take that to heart? I mean, she never left the house without looking perfect. So, wow. um, yeah, no, you know, my dad was more uh, into socializing in the business and things like that. And all of his behind the scenes people, producers and stuff, but, but um, I don't remember. And of course, I grew up during the time of the TV show. So it was really all about that. And then, you know, she didn't really do movies after that. So there may have been with John Wayne, probably not uh, Jean Seberg, sadly, because she was so interesting. But yeah, not that I know. No, that's great. Uh, uh, I want to make a comment real quick is that um, uh, it was interesting to see the Hollywood in the Heartland display at the historical building because two Oscar winners are Donna Reed and Cloris Leachman. And they were there in the same case. Well, a lot of people might not realize that <laughs> Cloris Leachman was a guest on a Donna Reed show episode at the beginning of season four. So here we have two Oscar winners, both from Iowa. <laughs> it's a cute episode, episode too. So that was pretty neat. Yeah. It is. Cloris Leachman yeah. plays her comedic role as you would expect her to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. You yeah. know, it was interesting because um, when my mother, you know, she never really appeared in any comedies. And so when she was faced with this aspect of the Donna Reed show, she was actually really nervous. And she 
was so funny. I mean, she had the talent for humor. And even when she told jokes at home, we, we would just be laughing so hard. She'd be like, what? You know, she just had a comic talent, even though it was not anything that, you know, she learned. <laughs> well, that's that's a good segue to the uh, what will maybe our last question because she does have a couple of good comedic pieces in "It's a Wonderful Life." She does. And, uh, you know, it didn't quite take off when your mom was still alive. But what do you think uh, her reaction, or what, how would you speak to the role "It's a Wonderful Life" has taken in American culture as a holiday film? Oh my God! I mean, that's just a huge question. I don't know. I mean, it's that movie is forever. And it's interesting the last few years, you know, over the years when I, when people start writing about it, they're like, you know, Jimmy Stewart. And then, you know, the way they refer to Mary Bailey was always just kind of so secondary and it always bothered me. Well, the last few years, I've been getting all these great questions about Mary Bailey and how she really, you know, is the fulcrum of the movie and, you know, she is so solid and she never wavers from what she wants and, you know, she's always there with the money and saving the day and so, um, and, and also too, I get a lot of women afterwards who say, you know, I have those same shoes that she wears in the last scene. So it's, it's great. I think she's um, just so dearly loved and I think her role has you know, people realize, you know, she's just not Jimmy Stewart's wife or the co-star, yeah. Kurt, anything you want to add to that? Talk, talk about a timeless movie with the perfect cast. You just can't imagine anybody playing the part of Mary Bailey other than Donna Reed or Jimmy Stewart playing his part as well. It just, you know, uh, and uh, if I mention the name Donna Reed to somebody and they're not sure and they'll say, well, have you seen the movie? It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, yeah. You know, their eyes light up and, you know, that Christmas classic. And, you know, it lost its copyright for a while. You know, you had to refile it. And so they're, you know, in the 80s and into the early 90s, it was showing on just every channel. But, you know, uh, it was meant to be. I think it caught a lot more eyes and a lot more, you know, fans and not only of the movie, but of Donna Reed. Yeah, there's, there's so many remarkable stories and so many great questions that we've had and apologize for not getting to all of them, but we do need to uh, wrap up, uh, you know, her Oscar career, uh, her uh, Golden Globe career, uh, just a remarkable uh, character, uh, not character, but person, uh, the good, good model for anyone just wanting to represent what what it means to be an Iowan. And so thank you, Mary, for your time. Thank you, Kurt, for your expertise and time. And Mary, for sharing those photographs <laughs> and, and reflecting on that. Yeah. Uh, but that's all the time that we have today. And so I want to thank everyone for joining us as well. Uh, we hope you have a great afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you virtually on Tuesday, March 30th for our ninth Iowa History Month webinar and thank you everyone thank you mary thank you Chris. yeah what a pleasure and thanks thank, thank you, you leo thank you everyone thank you yeah, yeah really appreciate it and with that we can end the webinar thank you very much all right